beautiful sunny where it's actually yeah, sunny, actually sunny Seattle, Seattle, Washington. This is the uh, what do we call our company again? <laughs> Wait, you don't even know anymore. What's the name? Of the Hairbrain <laughs> Schemes. Schemes. I got it now. Is the name? Wait, yeah. this is smooth as silk. The Hairbrain Schemes Battle Tech Monthly Q and A. Uh, I'm your host, Mitch Gittleman. Along with me is Mr. Nathan Wiseman. And our special guest this week, our month is uh, his dad. Right, that would be Jordan Weissman, creator, batter, batter, creator of Battletech, Shadowrun, Crimson Skies, WizKids, Hero Clicks, Hoo Ha. The Nate. short version Nate. is Nate. Uh, Nate. Yeah. It's Bring Your Dad to Work Day. It's Bring Your Dad to Work Day. <laughs> I, yeah, Emily did the same thing. Anyway, if you are just joining us and you are new to the station, Hyper RPG is a hyperactive, interactive, community driven uh, variety Twitch channel. And one of the things we do here is the makers of the new Battletech game coming next year to your PC, come on and answer questions from the audience. And so this month is a very special month. Uh, first of all, no McCain because we need far less pretty on the screen. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't bring the smolder. Right, we did not bring the smolder. But instead, uh, we're gonna be answering questions, Jordan and I, about actually how games are made. We call it how the sausage is made, but it's really behind the scenes at a game studio. And a lot of people really don't understand video game development. Mm -hmm. Like for example, one of our games I saw on Twitter a couple of weeks ago said that uh, our game Necropolis was probably made by about two to three people. <laughs> Which is very close. It was 20 to 30 people. Yeah, yeah depending upon the- Yeah, that's yeah. right. They just, maybe they should drop the zero. Yeah, or you, guy, you guys got a million dollars for, for the Shadowrun uh, Kickstarter, therefore you can do an open world like Skyrim Right? It's a million dollars. Okay. Anyway, so that's what this is about. Nate has gone on to BattletechGame.com, uh, where there's a whole bunch of questions waiting for us. Jordan and I do not know the questions. I thought it would be more fun to take them by surprise this, this time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, in case you guys don't know, every month uh, we go to the forums and we gather questions there and we put up a topic, and that's how we spend the first half of our time here on the Q&A answering. And then the second half we open it up and we take questions from you guys live. So. Uh, One more thing before we get started, just a little bookkeeping. You need to understand that uh, Hyper RPG uh, is community driven, but it's also community paid for. And so we need subscribers to keep this thing going. And we have a special going on right now, which is right here in my hand, which says, hold on, Daddy-o. Forever, thank you. Forever, that's, that's it right there. For every five, sub uh, five subscribers, we will give a Steam key giveaway. Every five subscribers. That's it, the rest of this is for the end of the show, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, first question uh, from our forums, and this is from X Astra. He responded first to it, so I figured that this would be a good, first! good, good, uh, good place to start. Uh, and as we uh, said, uh, how the sausage is made, he would like to know links or patties, but the serious question is, uh, for those of you uh, taking part in the Q&A, and as both of you are on here rather uh, often, what is the most disappointing decision uh, that you've had to make while making the game so far? Oh, or, the Battletech game? Yeah, and I'll Most... broaden this to uh, any game experience that you've you've had, but uh... yeah, I think we should do both. Right? Yeah. Well, first let's 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 go to the first question. Um, uh, I'm a Lynx guy. Is that right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I'm a Patty. I'm actually a Patty's guy See, now. That's that why we're that's why we're good partner. Good Boom. partners. Um, uh, most disappointing thing with uh, choice we had to make on uh, on Battletech so far. Um, well, in any game development, uh, there's this really terrible thing called scope, and it's not a mouthwash. Um, <laughs> you know, it is a mouthwash, but yeah. it's it, uh, it's it's the thing that is designed to crush the hopes and dreams of game designers. We should tell people what the Iron Triangle is. Oh, well, please, right. okay. Okay. Go. So there is an Iron Triangle in game development. It or, is or working a garage. You'll see yeah. the same one on the walls of your. Of yeah, your really. Yeah. yeah. Time, money, quality. Right. And in order for one to get bigger, another one has to get shorter, et cetera. But it is a triangle, and that's right. that. Well, and, and scope basically is imagining that, that pyramid getting bigger and bigger, right? So the, the, the smaller the scope, right, then the less money it takes to produce, you know, higher quality, right? If you, if you expand the scope, then it takes more and more money to produce an equivalent amount of quality and, and correspondingly a longer period of time. And one other thing about scope is the more things you plan to put in your game, uh, probably the less quality for each of those individual things, depending on how many yeah. people you have working on it. So what we like to do at Hairbrain Schemes is just focus on less things and increase the quality of those things. 
But anyway, disappointment. Oh, yeah. So I'm just saying, you know, there is, um, uh, like in any development, that you start with a whole bunch of ideas and then you trim down to what is the reasonable scope that you can accomplish. Uh, and so there's a lot of cool ideas that, that are, you know, kind of uh, uh, in files waiting for future development. Um, you know, some of those we've discussed, like co-op that we want to get to. We're not going to be able to get to that in launch. Um, there's a bunch of uh, kind of much more aggressive multiplayer goals that we'd love to get to, but that we're not going to be able to get to in the scope of this, of this first game. Uh, and so some of those, you know, are, are put into buckets of like, well, that's maybe something we can do post-launch as an update. Others are put into a bucket of like, you know what, that's for game two. Um, that's just that's just too big. Um, so some of those are cool things you wish were in game, you know. But yeah, that, I'm just trying to think of a of disappointment. It's usually, for me, it's a, a pet feature. Yeah, it's what it always want, is, right. right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that kind of actually addresses the question that I was going to bring up next, which was from Acolyte. Which uh, he wants to know if uh, when Jordan gets an idea out of scope, if Mitch follows you around just shouting pineapple until the idea goes away. <laughs> uh, but in a more realis uh, realistic uh, question, he wanted to know how often do these out of scope ideas get filed away for a live team or for, as you were saying, a next game. And uh, that well, filed away is everything, right? We don't, yeah, yeah we don't just drop an idea. But in, t in terms of you know how many actually get picked up and implemented at later dates. Um, it's a smaller percentage than you think, uh, oh, yeah. and it's it's not because they were bad ideas. It's because the uh, an idea is well to go back to the pineapple reference. It's kind of like an idea is is a bit like a piece of fruit, right? It has a shelf life. Um, oh yeah. And and so the idea that we came up with this great idea at the beginning of the game, and it was really relevant for what we wanted to do with the game at the time, and what was you know kind of what was. Uh, current in today in, in the gaming milieu at the moment right well two years from now when you're ready to pick up and 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 build the second title mm -hmm. well one the game that you actually ended up making is different than the game you thought you were going to make two years ago no that never happens <laughs> that always happens you i mean you know you always things it's always in the execution yeah. right so so things things moved and changed and modified so the idea may just be not relevant to the game you actually ended up making yeah. uh, or b that game that idea may now um have gone you know spoiled because a different game has implemented something which changes your thought about what it should have been or has so well implemented that you can't now put it into this game without looking like a copy of that game. In the case so, of the first game we made together uh, as Hairbrain Schemes, Crimson Steam Pirates. Yes. Right? Which we made in 12 weeks. Uh, and by the way, you can find that on iOS and Android still. Uh, <laughs> it's still a great game too, actually. I love that game. Seriously, that was the single most fun project of my career was doing that. That was that a was gas. A but what would happen is you would add two features, go to lunch, I would cut them, and you'd come back and say, that's okay, because I got another one to replace <laughs> it. And it was this it was this really fun cycle of just, nope, in, out, in, out, in, out, ship it. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, it's less that way with the more people you have on the project. You actually have to have a little bit more measured, much, much more stable. Plan. I, you yeah, mean, I mean, you got to compare. Uh, managing a company or a team of like, 50 people, they don't just turn on a dime. It's different like, than a team of eight? Yes. Yeah, no, it's it's really true. I mean, uh, a small a small team like that, you know, where you've got a short, a short, it's a small scope, yeah. a sh small team, you're able to be extremely nimble, you know? When you've got a, a much bigger pipeline, much bigger project, much bigger budget, you have to do a lot more downstream planning. And Which is not who we really are. That's why we have such a great team around <laughs> us, because what we are, it's just like, Chaos and less chaos. <laughs> so this isn't from the forums, but I, I'm just going to ask the follow-up question of what do you guys think the advantages are to having a small team and what kind of projects would you, you think are better for small teams versus a big team and the advantages that you have? It's the difference between having a Raven and an Atlas for me. Right? <laughs> Ooh, nice battle tech. Thank us. you very <laughs> much. Nicely done. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in the scope of things, actually, uh, you know, Hammering Scheme still runs very small teams, right? The battle tech team is about 35 people. Um, and uh, you know, as we hit peak, it'll be it's now getting up to peak. It's about 35 people in total. Um, in the scale of game development, that is a very small team. When you look at things like uh, <laughs> Destiny or, uh, or or Halo, which are literally 700 plus people on each of those teams, um, they're you know that that's an army uh, and has to be you know provisioned like an army and and directed like an army and it's all about command and control at that point just like an army exactly you know and so a 35 person team is still small enough where we have a uh, a fair amount of nimble and that's uh, nimbleness and that's why mitch and i wanted to start this place to begin with because you know having been at bungie and been at uh, microsoft where we've done those giant ones um that's so counter to our natural tendencies that it was really hard to do those <laughs> i like to just be able ones. to stand up in the middle of the room and say that feature's cut and everybody goes got it and then we move on <laughs> There's not an email. We never used email in the beginning. No. 
just um, like, we just shouted. Yeah, so I mean, I think 35 is still small to be nimble, but yet within that, to be efficient, you still want to make sure that you're, you, you have a, a pipeline, right? That your, your animators, your artists, um, your terrain environment people are working on things you're actually going to use rather than stuff you think you might use one day because you just can't afford to have stuff sit on the cutting room floor uh, to that extent. Uh, and so it, it's it, it's kind of, you know, similar to like a film development process, right? You've got, um, you know, your blue sky group that's coming up with a bunch of different feature concepts, right? Those are a whole bunch of different, you know, small design docs that, that are being generated. Um, then you've got, a, a, you know, our prototyping group, which will then take those and try to put them into practice. That's kind of like, you know, script reads, right? Just, mm -hmm. Is this actually work? Is this something, you know, it's ugly, there's no set, there's no t costume, it's even the wrong actors, but it's like we can get a sense whether this is working in a, in a prototype phase. If that's if that clears that hurdle, then it goes into actually go to the real engineering team and and the design team that's going to then actually oh how do we actually balance that? Where's the what's what's the levers for um, you know the content flow and the pipeline of of, of product because we have a lot of you know half our engineering team is just developing tools for our content team to be able to create content with right um, because a game is is really a, a a mechanism that you pour just tons and tons of content in and the more you've built that pipeline to make it efficient, the more content you get in, the more depth of the game you can end. Yeah. Or not even more, just faster. So that, yeah. and this is one of the keys, you, if you can get content through that pipeline, as you said, faster, then iteration is king. And so it's a matter of playing it, get feedback, polish it, hone it, polish it, and hone it. Yeah. And, and you know, quality is 100% reflection of iteration time. Mm -hmm. the, the more that you have, the more that you can iterate, and the quicker you can iterate, um, the higher the quality of the piece is. Because nothing is ever right the first time. I mean, the whole fiction of actually writing anything down or making anything the first time and it's great, it just doesn't, it's not reality, right? Everything takes many iterations to make to make really good. And so that, you know, investing in the ability to turn things around quick and learn and make them better is, is it seems in the beginning very frustrating because it's like, why aren't we making the game yet, you know? Um, but you gotta make that, that pipeline first. To, on Battletech, one of the things we did uh, that Mike McCain and I felt very, very strongly about, and we've done a much bigger on this than any other title, is that we we had two parallel efforts for the first six months of development, right? We had um, the pipeline and architecture development, which had, you know, which was just about... Code architecture. Code, yeah, code architecture uh, and, and building the pipeline tools. Uh, and then separate, we had a small team that was doing nothing but game prototyping. So we were able to you know, go through a whole bunch of different types of iterations on, on you know, things like the, t the round, uh, round order and initiative and um, the, you know, how we're going to do uh, combat resolution, all those kind of things. Movement. Yeah. yeah, all that stuff was done in these prototypes, which were just completely hideous to look at, right? They weren't, they didn't even attempt to be attractive. They were only about Control. literally moving, you know, cubes around and shooting at each other um, and just about understanding information flow and all that kind of stuff. And then 100% of that code and 100% of that art was thrown away, yeah. right? When the when the when the architecture was up to, to and and the pipeline was now at the point where we could then bring stuff over, all the, everything we've learned about the game was re-implemented on top of the actual game architecture, um, and it went from like in, in the space of two months, it went from this totally hideous, ugly prototype to this gorgeous, <laughs> you know, pro, um, yeah. actual game. And so for people who have been following the Kickstarter backing updates, that's the kind of the prototype phase that you were talking about transitioning to the more pre-alpha of what we were showing. Exactly. Kickstarter. Exactly. Super, so pre-alpha. Super pre-alpha. What, pre what we saw, yeah, the super pre-alpha was, was right after that transition. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, moving forward, you guys have been talking about pipelines. Uh, Lance Koth would, uh, on our forums, would like to know uh, what process do you guys to come up through with the uh, the setting and the story, and how does that get developed? Is that the similar type of pipeline? Uh, I know Andrew, our, our lead writer, would be the the correct person to field this question. Yeah, to, but, but Jordan was really heavily involved in, in yeah. that. Well, I think what, one of the uh, one of the great parts about working in a universe that's established is there's a lot of established stuff. One of the hard yeah. parts about working in a universe there's a lot of established. Yeah, stuff. exactly. It's but it's a it's kind of like learning. You have to surf underneath the pier <laughs> <laughs> between the pylons of existing uh, of, of existing canon. Um, and so uh, we knew kind of from a thematic standpoint where we wanted to be, which is that mm -hmm. we we wanted to be in, in the periphery. Uh, where we would have kind of more of a, a lawless environment and much smaller scale um, kingdoms because we wanted our, our brand new 
small mercenary unit that the player was going to be commanding to actually have um, enough scale to, to do something of import in this little political environment. Um, and so you can't, you know, a brand new mercenary unit isn't going to swing the fourth succession war, right? Well, from a, from a, um, from a how the sausage is made point of view, who, who decided that's what we should do? And how, how did decisions like that get made though? So that top level decision was really Mike McCain and myself were thinking about kind of what, what setting we wanted to do, what, what, you know, how we wanted the mercenary unit to engage. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we came up with kind of, that's broadly what we want. Then the lead designer, which is uh, Kevin McGinn, mm -hmm. um, dove into the lore and- uh, Oh yeah. Oh yeah, and, and went hardcore to find a place that we could have the flexibility um, uh, to have a number of planets, to put them in play. And, uh, and so he dug in there deep and, and, uh, and found this space, which there wasn't a lot written about, and yet we could tie into conveniently what was written about, so we weren't changing any, any canon. Um, and so then he then started developing, and you were involved in this part too, started developing the kind of geopolitical situations there um, to accomplish the kind of thematic setting that, that Mike uh, was really looking for in that. And then, uh, as you mentioned, Andrews, the lead writer, started to come in with uh, character, character mm -hmm. types uh, that would then be the characters that drove those plots. Uh, and of course, be, as we said, it's all iterative, right? I mean, everything we're talking about. Well, there's about, also a vetting process, right? We got to yeah. get it to Randall at Catalyst Game, La Game Labs. Yeah, so we, Tyler, yeah, you know, so, the lore uh, masters. Yeah, so we said uh, Randall, uh, you know, is on board uh, working with us as, uh, as kind of, you know, checking on our, our lore uh, to make sure that we're, that we're good on that. And then Tyler, obviously, he's, he's a, a long-term fan. Uh, as well, <clears throat> but yeah, and, and all that stuff's been rewritten now a dozen times, right? Um, to to make it better and tighter in those characters and the setting and the story, how the story develops. And on top of it, just the way it works is all of that planning then goes into mission creation, yep. and that's where it can iterate again <clears throat> yep. when it's actually on screen because nobody gives a flying hoot about your design docs oh, or yeah. your ideas. That was huh? well, well controlled. Thank you very that much. We're behind an age gate, but still. Uh, and so, you know, once it gets to, you know, the player's hands, the story can evolve because it has to, because that's what Well, yeah, because, really I mean, this is a game, it's not a book, right? So you're not yeah. going to read this story, you're yeah. going to play this story, and, and, you, uh, and as such, it has to be able to be ones that <clears throat> action speaks larger than words. Got to be things you can do, on, you know, in the game with the, with the control mechanisms we give you of the max end of your mercenary unit. Yeah, but by doing good. that work, I'm sorry, real fast, by doing that pre-production work, now we know how many missions there are gonna be, what they're about, what kind of units are gonna be in there, what sort of terrain we need to, to have in there. And so you're not just firing blind, like exactly. you said before, and stuff ends up on the cutting room floor. Exactly. So, uh, do a lot of work at HBS. How do you guys keep it fun and light and keep people uh, upbeat during uh, what could be, you know, tense development. Everyone hears horror stories of overtime and, and things coming out of the game industry. Uh, how do we keep well, uh, the atmosphere at HBS like? One, one of the reasons we're in Washington State is because of its great cannabis laws. That's right. Um, no, actually, this. that's not true. <laughs> that's not true at all. Um, there are bottles of Jack Daniels everywhere in the studio, though. <laughs> But that's that's really just for him. That is true. Because he's never, you know. Like, I need a way station, I right? Say, I can't he, walk more than ten or so steps. That's like, right. That's okay. All, that's Am all, I within arm's reach? That's right. It's like Starbucks for you know yeah. the normal person. Well, first of all, what you need to know is that we work in a completely open office uh, space, so there are no. Uh, sorry, there are no offices. Jordan doesn't have one. I don't have one. Everybody sits at four foot by two foot desks, which means we're breathing each other's air. Yeah, and they're all and they're all tightly packed. And oh, yeah. one of the reasons we do that is because it, it provides. Uh, a great deal more situational awareness for every member of the team. Uh, just standing up to go to the bathroom, you can see kind of half the development in front of you, and you might go, oh, "Wait, what's what's that on on you know that person's screen? That I don't that doesn't match with what I thought we were doing." That's and, not a raven. Yeah, or, and it's like immediately they can you know close or that on my screen. Right away. That's not safe for work. <laughs> Um, we should talk to HR. Hey, Mitch, what do you have on your screen? <laughs> not appropriate. I so, should probably have turned uh, that. But on. I think that actually that kind of um, close knit. Um, environment is one of the things that does actually make it more fun because um, you know no one uh, we believe that this is a completely collaborative art form right um, and it, it, I would argue one of the most collaborative art of all art forms I agree. Uh, in the way that you have to combine everything from you know software engineering uh, to game design to you know to screenwriting to uh, you know every form of art you can imagine audio audio uh, audio and audio, then audio. Ton, tons of audio work um, you know so 
I, beyond it, that, you're actually collaborating with your audience too, because the end effect is they have to interact. With absolutely it. true. Right. Absolutely. So it's so it's enormously collaborative, and and I think sometimes when you get into bigger companies. Uh, that tends to get lost. It's kind of like everybody you, by nature becomes more specialist, and you, you know, you are the the right thumb animator, and <laughs> that's what you do. Is, no, really, the, it is like oh that. yeah, the, yeah right, a, the right thumb, and and so it's very hard on a long project to kind of maintain enthusiasm for the right thumb. Um, I think that's part of it. Yeah. By the way, I, I also think I, we don't have a lot of hierarchy, right? Very People flat. have roles on the team, and you know, my role is to make decisions. You know, I'm McCain, for example. His role is to make decisions, but it's not level-based or hierarchical, and, and we make a lot of fun of ourselves and each other. Right, and that's where I was going, is that, that here, because of this kind of open environment where we, you know, everybody contributes. So if you've got, a, you know, like a game, if you've got an opinion on how the game is playing, or, or, or a feature, or a story point, or an art point, it's, it's encouraged that you're sharing them, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's required that you listen to your, uh, you know, to your teammates. It, not that you have to do what they say. For if, I, if I'm animating this piece, I want to get input. I'm ultimately going to animate it, you know, <clears throat> um, and I'm the one that actually has to make it work. But I want to get that input. And, and I think that the ability to, to influence the game is what makes making games fun and keeps the environment fun. Well, and I think to, and we have to add to that because we, we have a very, very clear set of values in the way the studio is run that we live every single day. And I think it's really important when you're making uh, a creative and fun environment, You d there are keys to doing it, right? Which is respecting the people you work with and yep. on only hiring people you can respect, right? Uh, so being respectful, being highly collaborative, uh, listening and really taking feedback. And once people realize oh, that all, all of these things are real and that the people they're working with are approachable, now you can actually be yourself at yeah. work. And the respect thing is, is probably the, the biggest one for us. Uh, it's respect of your coworkers because if you really respect somebody, you can disagree with them without any malice. It's about the game, it's part. about the work, it's not <clears> about right. you. And the other part for us is respect for you, the audience. Um, you know, sometimes... Uh, not you. <clears throat> I'm looking at... You know who you are. Yeah, over on the right. Yeah. Um, uh, but no, but respecting your audience is absolutely key. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, we want to make sure that we're delivering something that, to the best of our ability, is a great value uh, for your money um, and, and lives up to your house, especially in a property like Battletech, which all of us have so much, you know, emotional investment in. That's an emotional investment we really respect. And we, we're trying absolutely our hardest, um, you know, to... Uh, uh, to, to, to deliver on you know 30 years of, of pent up uh, energies for what for what we want this game to mech be mech porn <laughs> yeah, totally. pent up mech porn energy so I have one more question that I'm going to be asking from the forum uh, but if you guys want to start dropping questions in on the um, chat we're going to get to those in a second sorry the, these guys have had been kind of long winded with their answers oh, sorry so that we didn't get to as many questions as I, I may have liked but uh, good answers we'll, nonetheless we'll, we'll go on the speed round here sure yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. speed round let's well go. this actually I think is an important question that might take some time oh uh, sorry uh, nice and I, it's in the sense of uh, you know how the sausage is made in the game industry overall um, this is coming from someone outside of the industry uh, 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 Modred, Modred uh, 189 oh, sorry yeah. if I horribly mispronounced your name uh, why uh, why does every game have crunch time why is it improperly in it, uh, his words to properly schedule uh, development or how does crunch time uh, come about is it something that is planned from the beginning or is it something that uh, is yeah, uh, um, that's an excellent question, and and something that has been uh, really abused uh, quite significantly. Well, let's start this industry. way. If you're planning for crunch time, you're a dick. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Now go ahead. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean that's the bottom line. Because um, uh, there are many stories, and they continue to happen, of studios that will be in crunch for months on end, where they're working six and seven days a week for months on end. Um, Eighty plus hours. We, oh yeah, 80 would be conservative, right? Yeah. I mean, you know. Uh, Sometimes 120. Yeah, 100, 100, 120 hours. Uh, we've been through those. We've lived through those. We've, <laughs> we've come to the conclusion early, you know, many years ago that that doesn't work. Um, that, the, that the efficiency, the amount of output you're getting, quality output just continues to drop and that kind of thing. And, and you can fool yourself into make, thinking they're working, but what we don't believe it does. Uh, so one of our kind of things that we've done at, at HBS is to to limit ourselves and to, in that respect and say, hey, if we have to do crunch, a like Mitch said, you don't plan on crunch. Crunch is to get yourself out of 
a problem that you've inadvertently created, right? You or <clears throat> yeah, uh, sorry, yeah, it is. Or to you know what? There's this thing we really want, and we're passionate about it. And and this is how some people put themselves in the crunch too. It's like I need to get that thing in. I want that, and I'm going to put in. Yeah, and, and an individual too. team member, absolutely. Yeah. And individual team members, we you know, I mean, we're here because we we're passionate about making games, and that's I'm. That drives many team members to kind of put in longer hours a week just because there's something they want in the game and they're making it happen. Yeah. Uh, but when it's a larger team crunch, crunch, you know, that that's usually as a result of we've encountered issues that we didn't anticipate. Mm -hmm. And so we're behind schedule on kind of core stuff that we can't cut. Uh, and we need to make that up, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you know, or, uh, you know, we're the, the pot, you know, we're, we're encountering bugs uh, in, you know, kind of right at the end where we're, we're really trying to get the polish level up and we're encountering stuff and we have to make up. Uh, you know, make up for, for crunch time in that respect. Um, but we, we've tried to always say, hey, let's a never go seven days a week. Um, never go more than, you know, uh, like, like two weeks. Yeah, two weeks in length and, and, and never go around the clock on a stupidity kind of thing. No, it's like, and we actually- Not anymore. I mean, when, things, Mitch, when we were younger, we did that. Well, yeah. What, <laughs> By younger, I mean- yeah. Go back to Crimson Steam Pirates. Um, that was that was intense, but uh, uh, you were younger technically. Yeah, was, if you look right. at the pictures, we both look way younger. <laughs> but one of the things Mitch actually came up with a couple years ago, which I was very dubious about, but really worked uh, wonderfully, was that normally what happens in crunch is pe people you know kind of get in by ten and and then you crunch and you go late into the evening. Um, and Mitch said, hey, why don't we reverse this? Why don't we say when we crunch, everybody gets in early. Um, so that we still get everybody gets out in time to like go home, have dinner with your family, you know, kiss kids goodnight, um, and and you get more sleep because what happens is you, you would say, oh, we're gonna start at ten and everybody be out by by ten and it's a twelve hour day and and but then it, you know then it slips to eleven then it slips to twelve you know and then all of a sudden people are there all night long is what will happen in some studios we've seen. So Mitch's idea was, hey, let's shift it early. It's like, hey, if we need to add extra hours to the day. Let's say everybody in by seven, we serve breakfast rather than serve dinner and get everybody out, you know, by seven so they actually go home and see your family. Uh, I was dubious about that because like, you know, game developers are not usually early morning risers, um, but it's it's worked wonderfully. It really yeah. has. And it's become, I think, a, a key thing for making, when we do have to do crunch, um, making it much more humane. Cool. Uh, so moving over to questions from, from uh, chat. Thank you guys for, uh, bringing up so many. Uh, so the first question, and uh, not quite as important, but I think uh, maybe for Mitch it is. Uh, what is the decision to whiskey ratio? Decision, <laughs> to, you mean how much whiskey do I have to make a decision? Yeah, like uh, cup to decision. The like. truth is, first of all, I don't drink and make decisions. <laughs> uh, I make decisions, then I drink. Either, uh, well, either way, I mean, it's, it's a cause and effect relationship one way or the other. Yeah, it depends <laughs> on the game, it just depends on the time of year, but it's usually like 14 to 1. <laughs> 14 decisions to one glass, or? No. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad we got that But clear. my doctor and I are talking about that, let's move uh, on. The other uh, qu whiskey question I was informed that I asked the, <laughs> the wrong one, not the important one, is what is your favorite whiskey? I know the answer to this. Oh yeah, to... because I introduced you to it at It Gen is now my favorite whiskey ago. too. Uh, yeah, I'd say my favorite is, uh, that I don't drink very often is, uh, well actually more often than not, is called Basil Hayden, it's a bourbon, it's really good. But uh, on the that's on the bourbon side, and then uh, if you're a Scotch drinker, I'm a Lagavulin man. There you go. Uh, <laughs> so here's a question: uh, Post launch, that is how the sausage is made. To be fair, well, hey, I, <clears throat> myself, what I'm I'm beer at best. Yeah, he's so a beer I, guy. I don't touch the hard stuff at all. <laughs> so this goes into a bit of a post launch planning. But is there a, a potential for more a, uh, mechs being added to the game post launch? Uh, what is there? Is there any thinking around that? <clears throat> sure, there's thinking. Yeah, there is. Um, we don't we don't have plans yet, but we are thinking. The, one of the key things in, in to the sausage is made uh, discussion is metrics. Um, uh, early on in a game, you don't know how long it's going to take you to make anything because you, you don't have the pipelines established, um, and so you don't you don't really know. And we are only over the next couple of months are the pipelines finished enough that we're actually going to have good metrics for for how long it really takes to make maps, how long it takes to animate and do all the data we need for mechs, um, all that kind of stuff. And so once we start to get that data, that will then help us understand um, not only what what fits into the base game, um, but but what you know what is the pattern and what would be the process for doing post-game 
uh, post game. And by that logic, because then we know how long it takes to let's just say get a new mech in the game. We also understand, frankly, how much money it costs. Yeah. To get a new mech in the game, yeah, and then you time take equals that you money. Go, right. Yeah. Time equals money. Period. And then it's like, well, then by that logic, we would have to charge this much. Wait a minute, nobody's going to spend that much. And then you have to make decisions yeah, based and, on and that. Yeah, and we too. haven't decided what you know how we're handling uh, post-game content yet. But uh, but th but it is uh, it's this, this concept of understanding how long it takes to do stuff is a critical junction in a project because until you until you have those metrics, you can't do it's all, all the fantasy. rest of your the whole back half of the planning. <clears throat> it all has to be based on real metrics. And, yep. And we're just getting to that point now. Yeah. Cool. <clears throat> um, I don't want to ask that question. Sorry, chat. Uh, <laughs> oh. Whoa. Uh, not ain't boxers or briefs. No. Uh, yeah. But what about real whiskey, not Scottish trash, is, is the question. Uh, but <laughs> Tyler is going to Japan in a couple of weeks, and he said he's bringing me back some gifts. Oh, interesting. Speaking of Tyler, uh, how much has DFA had an effect on the Battletech game, and has any of that been un like unexpected? So, uh, I know that Tyler... Well, the one effect is that I take Tyler out for a cigar multiple times a week so we can work on DFA. So that's one, that's one time suck that it does, but then also he is looking at uh, ways of tying DFA together with locations uh, in uh, the Battletech story and perhaps some people you can meet. Yeah, I think we've also talked about uh, perhaps some fun little Easter eggs that if you watch DFA and you watch <laughs> the right planet, there's a chance that you might fight on some iconic battlefields, but uh, that's, you know, we'll see. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's all, yeah. Like see, Jordan uh, said, until you have your metrics, yeah, everything's exactly. bullet. <clears throat> the, the other really key uh, development tool we didn't mention is the Magic 8-Ball. Yes! Yeah, answer, answer Hazy, try again later. Yeah. How often do you guys find uh, projects sliding behind schedule, and what's your, your response to when you when you discover this? Uh, how often? 100% uh, of the time. Yeah, every two months. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it's um, like that. It's yeah. every, so every, every time you look, it's behind schedule. No, no, every well, time you have a milestone, things go in. There are exactly. things that get added to a milestone that you didn't expect to get, and there are things that you didn't get that you wanted to get. That's right, and the, and the key thing that, that this all, you know, about, what, five, six years ago, seven years ago? I lose track of time. Uh, this concept of agile development. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> was, um, which was introduced, which uh, is absolutely a, a better way to do things. Um, uh, historically, you'd have this this giant, you know, what was called waterfall plan of every feature and, and everything. This that is exactly to, how it's going to work. Yeah, it's going to come down. And, it's like and then you, it's m immediately wrong. Right. So you, somebody would spend months and months building this incredible plan that was supposed to take you out for two years of development. And by like day three, it's wrong. And it became a full time job to keep updating two years worth of plan. Yes. Which it, and yes. it was just it was it was bad expense of fiction. Um, and so agile development says, um, you know, we have a we have a broad strokes plan of the entire process. Uh, and then we have highly detailed uh, of what we're going to do over the next two weeks and one month. Um, and so we, we know exactly what we're looking at for in these sprints. Uh, and when a sprint, when you get to the end of the date of the sprint, you measure what did we get done and what didn't we get done, right? Um, what what if we didn't get done has to get done, so it needs to move forward into the next sprint. Right. What that didn't get done could be could be cut, mm -hmm. you know. And anything that we had to move forward into the next sprint means something else downstream needs That's to get change. cut. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Either it needs to get reduced in scope or cut altogether, mm -hmm. because otherwise you're just building this this debt, this development debt, well which done. keeps building all the way across the project. Um, and that's, you know, that's, if you take that process seriously, it really helps you produce a product, uh, you know, actually finish one reasonably close to budget yeah. and schedule, uh, which so far I think our organization has done a pretty, pretty good job at. Um, you know, we've now shipped, uh, I've actually, we just shipped, we've shipped seven titles from Harebrained Schemes. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, they're for all, you know, from small mobile titles up to uh, up to big RPGs or, or you know, into uh, the real, the, the, the big one, uh, Necropolis. So it's mostly working and it's, it's, you, you have to take the responsibility of, of constantly trimming. And that's why sometimes we come back to you and say, hey, we were excited about Feature XYZ. It's not gonna be in the game and here's why. You know, and that, that will happen. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna just answer a few questions that have been popping up that I think we can get through really quick. Can you blow off arms and legs and things on mechs? Yes, you can, and it will be awesome. Can you pick those up and beat other mechs? No, you can't, and it won't be as awesome. Um, 
<laughs> but there are physical on. attacks in the game. There are yes. charging and other and, things. And it is, oh, it's glorious you, watching. All of that is, is glorious Finally. Awesome. Uh, it's so, Finally. It, it's it's right? too rough to show yet, but it it's cool to see them punching it, each other. It is very cool. First time ever mm -hmm. in a Battletech slash MechWarrior game, melee combat is actually in the game. I mean, the last time melee combat was in the game, it was the word kick and the word punch on the screen. <laughs> and that was, you know, 20... Uh, four years ago or something like that. But yeah, now watching him, it's awesome. Shout out to our animator, uh, Holly Menger, oh, and also uh, you, Steve Holly. Reinders, who uh, is working on that too. Yeah, it's stuff's right awesome. Yeah. Looking great. So uh, HBS often is working on more than one project at once. How do you guys uh, organize the team so that people aren't distracted or are involved in what is going on on other teams or with other projects? Oh, with Necropolis and Battletech, we've had people on two different floors. We're actually in this goofy ass building. We're not exactly in you know game development heaven at Hairbrain Schemes. We actually rent out office space from an aeronautics supply company, and so uh, and we're, we're kind of pushed into the corners of spots of the building they're not using. Yeah, and we're on two floors, which meant you know uh, that Necropolis has been on one floor and BattleTech's been on another, and that's how we've actually kept them separated. Now, frankly, we don't like that. Uh, having them separated like that. You you want some division, but you want that crossover and that cross-pollinization. Yeah. Also, um, you know, a, t a team is not a constant number of people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, the old Monty Python sketch that dinosaurs are thin on one end, generally thicker in the middle and thin on the other. Uh, well, game development teams are the same. You start with very few people when you're in your concept, uh, pre, you know, concept phase and your pre-production phase, and then you slowly scale, right? And and uh, and you only want to bring on the, the you know the bulk of that, the the top of the dinosaur hump there, when your pipeline is is ready for them. So that's where we're just getting to now on on BattleTech. Mm -hmm. Over the next month, we'll hit, we'll start to hit our peak, and then you'll hold that peak um, for a long time. And then uh, as you move closer to ship, then you'll start peeling people off. Right down to the to the smaller ship team, which is doing you know all the iteration and testing, everything necessary before. And you, ship. one of the reasons you want to peel them off, number one is cost, and so that you can move them on to something else. But the other thing is, near the end of the project, you want less fingers in the pie, yeah. because every person that can contribute also can make well not bugs, yeah. right? And yeah. that's something that has to be fixed. It's true. Um, uh, question that. Uh, we've answered before but might be worth touching on uh people are wanting to create their own campaigns like they have uh with the shadowrun editor is there going to be a similar tool for BattleTech? no no there isn't no Sorry, uh, the uh one of, one of the places we're talking about places where you make mistakes um our our estimation of what the cost of developing the shadowrun content editor was going to be was dramatically off uh, and by a factor of like four. Yeah, it was way, way off. Yeah. And, uh, and so it, it was very expensive part of that project. Um, and so we, uh, we just felt, in this case, we needed to focus much more on, on the depth of game and the gameplay and the you know, number of mechs and, and those kind of things. And so um, there's going to be a large number of maps for people to use, but you're not going to be able to create your own your own. Right, you'll and, create your own scenarios with the skirmish mode and stuff well, like in, that. Well, yeah, in that you can pick, you can pick who you want to fight and, um, and, and, and so on, but you're not going to be able to like, set, right. you, yeah, be able so to choose victory conditions, not create new victory conditions. If you, the best case would be if I was wanted to run a campaign for my friends is I could play the enemy, they could play absolutely. on the skirmish mode and we could pick skirmish maps right. and play that way. If yes, we had absolutely. wanted to do that, to create a map editor or something like that, that would have been a stretch goal or something for us so that we could actually plan for it from the beginning and finance it, so yeah. to speak, and, and from the can, beginning. We considered it and the cost of the stretch goal was, was out of whack. I don't think we would have actually... So we're know. taking our backers' money and putting it into the game you buy and play right there day one. People are asking for a Kickstarter for us now. Uh, just so you know. Hey, something, uh, something to think about in the future. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, thinking about uh, the future and being entrepreneurial, uh, this question is particular for you. Uh, can you Do you have any advice for people who are looking at uh, starting up companies or uh, entrepreneurial efforts? Uh, well, that, we could do a whole talk on that. Always, um, no, never. <laughs> always keep a litter bag in your car. If it gets full, you can just <laughs> toss it out the window and keep going. Uh, I mean, the short form uh, of the advice is um, uh, there is no such thing as too much homework. Uh, really understand the marketplace you're going into, how you're going to reach your consumers, uh, how you're going to make consumers aware that your product exists. Network, uh, network, network. Um, yeah, and so that's number one. Really do the homework. Uh, and number two is, you know, don't spend any penny you don't have to. We were just talking about our offices. I mean, you know, we spend, a, a, you know, we spend a ridiculously low amount on rent because we don't believe rent adds value to the consumer, right? Um, as long as we're in a neighborhood that's safe for our employees, 
um, and you know has access to food. It's like we just don't have any ego tied up in our offices because we don't think that puts value into the consumer. And uh, it also gives us, you know, a, a, when we're, you know, gives us more runway to put money into, put the money into the game rather than into that kind of thing. So like, don't get an office. I mean, I remember like, you know, things like don't go print business cards until you need them. Oh, I mean, I mean, just like, don't spend any dollar until you, until you needed to spend it several months ago, you know? We, uh, we could do a longer talk on that. Yeah. yeah. That's a bigger subject. You, you in fact teach an entire class. I do that, at USC, right? yeah. yeah. At creative uh, entrepreneurship. There, it's a big topic. Uh, I keep trying to find a question that keeps going away. I'm sorry, guys. Um, uh, how does uh, how is HBS aspect of a QA team compared to other studios? And this is from uh, Lady Kakaku. Kakaku. I can't pronounce words. I'm sorry. Hi, met you at PAX. Nice to meet you. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. So yeah. is uh, how QA. do QA? What how, about QA? How do our QA practices compare to other other studios? Uh, uh, they go studio by studio. For example, at Nintendo, what they do is they just throw bodies at a game. They just they just throw untrained people and they just say keep going, keep going, and then they just they, they, and bugs just pop out of it. And they wait till the very end of production to do that. We uh, go a different direction that we have QA people on the projects, often from the very beginning, so that they're, they understand the game, they understand they're testing elements uh, as they come online, et cetera, and giving feedback. But we, we have internal and external tests. So we have a, only a few internal test people that really understand the game, really understand what's going on on the team. And then, frankly, we outsource our test uh, to Poland, uh, where, you know, frankly, it's less expensive. But these people are really professionals and very, very good at it. And what's great about doing your test in Poland, actually, is uh, our day is their night. And so we can finish our work, send it to them, and we get in fresh uh, and early in the morning with a big bug list waiting for us. Yeah. And that's how we do it. Um. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you automate, uh, this one just came up first, so it's getting asked. Uh, do you automate, uh, do you have automated code tests? Uh, no, should we? Yeah. Short and tweet. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> just trying so, to get through as many as uh, Several people have asked, when are you guys going to focus on a new Crimson Skies game? When are you going to focus on that? that that's the, um, not when is it going to happen. <laughs> when are you, <laughs> what are you going to focus on? I like that, yeah, that's pretty focus? determined. Um, yeah, exactly, when? So I'm, I, uh, I'm not at liberty to say, Senator. Yeah, um, can't can't say. Yeah, no, I mean it's uh, it remains one we'd love to do and a, yeah. and, a, and a passion piece for us, and we think there's so many great stories we'd love to tell. And about. we don't have the license. And we don't have the license, but you know we're in constant discussions with Microsoft, and hopefully one day you we know, will win. We'll win, so we'll be able to do it. We'll win. Um, do we do friends and uh, family beta tests? And apparently, I don't count as friends or family. Thanks, wow. people. <laughs> Ouch. Oh. Yeah, uh, we do friends and family a lot, and for every game that we make. Yeah, and um, and, and of course, you know, one of the things for this game, which is it's just gonna be awesome, is the backers beta, um, uh, which is you know something where we're gonna have the skirmish modes um, available, uh, and that's something we're looking to get a lot of great information out of um, because. As you know, in a game like this, balance is so critical, and that's in a small sample. It's very hard to get balanced out of. Right. You know, so one of the things we're excited about in the uh, in the backers beta, which is going to be this winter, uh, is to be able to look at a large data sample and, and make sure that you know the mechs are balanced appropriately. Um, so that's something we're we're totally excited about. Cool, and uh, you can still get in on that if you're going there. See, I know. I yeah. If still... you go to BattletechGame.com, you can still become a late reinforcement backer and for 50 American dollars get into that uh, closed beta. So uh, a lot of people are expressing their love for the new uh, Necropolis expansion, Brutal Edition. Check it out. Oh, thank uh, you. But they're wondering uh, uh, what other updates are in the works or is there anything planned? And they uh, and hope we're not one. abandoning the game. <laughs> the answer to that is in success all things are possible and it's going to take more money to make more content for that. Cool. So tell your friends. And don't forget, it's coming out on uh, consoles later this summer. Yeah, Xbox, like, maybe yeah. later this month. Yeah. We're just waiting for certification, and then we'll make an official announcement. And that is Xbox and PS4. So. That's, That's correct. Simultaneously, same day. Uh, <laughs> uh, how many American dollars will it cost me to get a box with all the extra backer swag that was left over? Is that possible? <laughs> no. Uh, no, everything uh, with uh, backer stuff, it's all made to order. Um, right. So there is no big warehouse full of, of cool stuff. 
Um, and I'm still waiting for my jacket. Yeah. I actually still haven't picked up my stuff either. Well, uh, oh, the jackets anyway. haven't arrived yet. Well, I haven't even team. got my banners yet. Ah. Well, they all come at one time. Yep. Uh, so how useful is uh, that MWR has models for the battle mechs, uh, and I know we're using some of them, but what does it take to convert them from their models to what we're using in the game? Yeah, you because know what's funny about that, just let me start, what's interesting, Jordan was saying earlier, it's like, how long does it take to get a mech in the game? And for a lot of people that understand that Mech Warrior Online is allowing us, and Pariah is allowing us to use your, their mechs, you would think, well, well then it's kind of like tomorrow, right? You get it in, they're in. But that's not the case at all. No, it's not. Uh, look at the uh, using work, working with Prana to do the mechs is, is a huge leg huge. up, huge, right? Because those, they're very expensive to model, uh, and they and so the geometry comes across pretty clean, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and so that's not a big conversion process. Like mm -hmm. uh, within a day, we can have the geometry. But our our animation solutions are dramatically different than theirs, and so all of our uh, we all of our animation has to be done pretty much from scratch. Uh, and we're doing a lot of types of animation they don't, such as throwing punches and kicks. So even if we were able to convert Standing their animation, back up after you've fallen yeah, down. exactly. Um, you know, all there's a, there's just a lot of animations we're putting in that they didn't need for their game. And and as I said, the animation systems are are different to begin with. Um, and then also our texturing solutions are very different for how we're our mechs um, getting all you know getting all the paint schemes and the damage and all of that kind of stuff. Our solution is different from theirs, uh, and it's driven by kind of the needs of the two games, right? Um, so that that requires a bunch of work as well, um, and we're actually this we're right now in the process of um, uh, going taking our first mech with the pipelines all in place all the way through the chain. Now we've gotten obviously several mechs through, but those are kind of if you will all kind of handcrafted. And they all took a long time to to do. Now the pipelines are in place. We're starting to measure the metrics of getting mechs through the pipeline in a more efficient way, and that'll that'll give us a sense of what it, what does it really take and how many will actually have. Yeah. Uh -huh. Will there be mechs uh, that aren't PGIs? Like, well, are we uh, going to look to create our own models at any uh, point? Probably not for the initial launch. Uh, well, I can say certainly well, not. Not, not for, for the initial not launch. Not for the initial launch is a, is a sure thing. Uh, uh, afterwards, it's it's certainly potentially possible, again, based upon uh, the success and in install base and audience demand. Uh, talking about paint scheming, uh, how many different paint variations are you guys looking at? Or like, there's a, I know there's actually a large amount of customization people are going to have on their paint jobs. Are you going to be able to upload your own uh, banner images or and things like that for your your mercenary team? Uh, you know, those those systems don't exist. They don't. Yeah. yeah. So all we know right now, what we have is kind of the design docs on them. Um, yeah. Uh, the uh, right now we're not looking at uh, uploading custom textures. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we're looking at being able to have a very large amount of customization of all the elements we presented and uh, a very big kind of design suite to work from, but not doing custom texture. Just there is a whole bunch of technical and also social things that you have to watch out for when you let people upload their stuff, right? And then you're in a multiplayer environment. And we, we right now just don't want to, you know, put our toe in the water and deal with those as initial issues. Cause again, we think we want to stay focused on, on you know, the main game um, and not get mired in that muck right from the beginning. One of the biggest challenges of game development is staying focused. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Not, not getting lost in the weeds of... Oh, well, we <laughs> could do... Well, what's the next cool thing we could do? Or, oh, yeah. yeah. Or let's polish this thing until it absolutely shines. Oh, we don't have time to do that. Yeah. Uh, speaking of not having time, we're in our last 10 minutes, so uh, we like to use this as a kind of a speed round, so keep throwing questions Lightning in. Lightning round! Ideally, something that they can answer fast. Fast! Uh, not like dick sticks everywhere. Come on, guys. Um, too cold, too cold. <laughs> uh, so, uh, someone was wondering if the $80 level of the, uh, since we've opened up uh, kind of late backers, uh, if, if the digital levels, if the $80 digital level would be available for them to find, get their way into the Order of Valhalla. No, we decided uh, not to do that. We thought we wanted to keep the Order of Valhalla um, as elite as it was during our Kickstarter, so as not to, uh, you know, dilute that value. You can, we believe you'll be able to get into the Order of Valhalla through deeds, not money. Yeah, eventually, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah the goal is that through work and through playing the game, you'll be able to earn your way in, whether that's multiplayer in the campaign yeah. or somehow. That and that's a post-launch thing. It's, yeah, it is all ethereal ideas <laughs> at yeah. this point, but yeah. yeah. We wanted to take your money, but we felt bad about it, so. 
Aww. That's First time. Honest today. game design, designer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Thought about it, though. Are you going to limit the amount of units on the field uh, to Battletech to being four uh, per side, or will you allow uh, for more settings uh, slash campaigns? So I think uh, we, on your side, you will only ever be controlling a Lance of four max. Space. That's correct. Um, and in multiplayer. And in multiplayer, each each player only controls a Lance as well. Uh, when you're when you're fighting against the AI, um, they will have a great deal more mini resources than you will have available. Uh, but so they're not limited to four, but you are. Um, is the uh, will we support modding at all? Uh, we're not. We, I guess we're not putting out any tools for modding as we just. We're not going to support earlier. modding. Right. We're not going to stop. We're not going to stop okay. modding. Yeah, we're not. We're not working to avoid it. We're yeah. also not working. We're, we're not putting in features to support it. Uh, does Mitch have his personal cheat code so that he can uh, have Star Era League Tech in uh, in skirmishes? I am hoping to have a cheat code so that my mechs will all have eye patches. <laughs> That's like Star League Era Tech. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Any plans for the cast and crew on DFA and Hyper to do voices in the game? No plans for voices in the game yet. Uh, will there ever be another opportunity for those epic Battletech jackets miss the Kickstarter by day? Oh, oh mother. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, as we mentioned before, we continue to try to work with Tops to figure out some sort of licensing arrangement. Um, if we are successful in that. It's only been 12 months <laughs> of negotiations. Oh, any day my, now, though. Any my day. pain. Oh my god. Anyway, if we, but it's if we, actually if we, easier to negotiate with Microsoft, which is saying a lot. <laughs> That's saying a lot. Anyway, uh, but if we are ever available, if we ever, if we ever get that boulder up the hill, uh, then we're going to be able to make some cool stuff like. We'll sell you so stuff. Going. Don't so, worry. But. How open are you guys personally to player feedback ideas? Is it welcome? No. <laughs> Such wait, yeah. yeah. We, if we you've actually have never forums. been on the forums. Wait, we actually Mitch doesn't interact. Yeah, it's, we it's, actually have an official sort of HBS answer to this that we figured out during um, the Shadowrun games, and that is the best way for us to take feedback is for you guys to talk amongst yourselves. We don't mind putting out a topic. But, but direct one-to-one, -one, like, you should do it this way. Oh, we respond. Now we get into this weird sort of debate online. That's not cool. It's not useful, really. It's far more useful for y'all to debate each other because you guys know the material even better than we do, right? Because uh, you've been studying it even longer, and you, you have all of these really interesting conversations and debates taking into account a whole bunch of things that we may not have thought about, and we could well, sit back and distill that information. Exactly. It, it's, I think that's the issue, is, is the amount of time that, 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 you know, this is kind of one of the things we, we learned when doing alternate reality games, ARGs, is right, the audience has, in cumulative, an infinite amount of time available. Mm -hmm. Whereas the development team has a very small amount of time in comparison to the audience. And brain power. Yeah, exactly. And so when you guys actually debate something, you're actually helping us. Oh, right? yeah. Because you're putting really good thought, If you're assuming you're doing it in a, in a constructive manner. If you're, if just, you're on BattletechGame.com, that is enforced. Yeah, and, and so in a constructive manner, a, a discussion on something like that really is very beneficial to us. And we do pay attention to them oh, yeah. uh, and, and take away great learnings from it. So yes, we take design feedback and we take it very seriously. So I didn't want to talk about this today, but people keep asking, so I'm, mm -hmm. going, to, I'm going to bring it up. Mm -hmm. uh, can we get an update on infantry? Yeah. Um, sure. So yeah, there is no update on infantry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the update is there isn't one yet. Um, well, I'll say this for sure. Infantry is currently not in the game. Correct. Yet. Yeah, so it, it, it is below the cut line at the moment. We'll see what future developments bring. Um, so we don't want to, you know, crush hopes yet, but we also don't want to make any hopes yet. Right. right. As now, Jordan said, we're going through, we're getting these metrics. And so as you're creating these metrics, the things on the cut line just go down, down, down. Or the cut line gets higher, higher, higher. Exactly. In a way. Yeah. Um, there was another question. Uh, and probably our last one. <laughs> yeah. So to wrap it up, if you guys could undo one piece of lore in Battletech, what would it oh, be? Oh, lore. Oh, fascinating. <laughs> I can't imagine what your answer will be, Weissman. Wow. It's a long... Whatever it okay. is, just be, be ready. The one there, piece... is, there is no right answer. Yeah. The one, no, no there, is, there is one right answer to this question. Without alienating your audience. Go there, ahead. Go. go for it. The one right answer of the one piece of lore I would undo are the intelligent talking birds. I knew you were going there. <laughs> the, the talking... Squawk! 
Okay, <laughs> taking that off the table because nope, that's my easy answer. I mean, now little... you're gonna say you want to take quads off. Well, you can't take something that's already been officially taken out and say yes, we would like, we'd like to take that out. That is. All right. Well, I thought that was the question. Oh, it's, it's been what, taken out. It's already been taken all out. Right, so take all right, it. so of, of lore that hasn't been recanted yet. Um, wow, one piece. Yeah. Um, I was really, I mean, there's so many things, but one top ahead only because I've been working on character stuff lately is I never, I didn't like the way the Black Widow died at all. Well, she was your pet character. She was a pet character of mine. You were just never going to be happy when she died. So. I just, yeah, but come it's on. It's like I killing mean, your she, wife. She needed, well, yeah, okay, we're not going there. But uh, yeah, she, she, need, she needed a much better exit in my mind. Yeah. So. Well, maybe we can fix that one day. Uh, you look at well, you can't mess with lore, but drama you might be able to ramp up. <laughs> I, I, I know your answer, and but Basil you know. Hayden. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. No, I, I you know. You, right, you let's have, move on. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Uh, we so we have four more minutes left. Um, we don't have a ton of time, but uh, a lot of people, by the way, the two popular answers chat shouted out was uh, the jihad and the clans. So, I know, and I want. I, I didn't uh, want to touch. Not those were live grenades that I wasn't going to touch. Yeah. Some people like the jihad because it, you know, crazy things happened. It's true. They're out there. The internet. It's a big place. Well, the, crazy and, happens too. Yeah. We'll move on. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I think that's about all the time we have here today. But all right. Mitch has uh, some more announcements. I do. I have them right here, Jordan. And I'm here to help. Thank you. Perfect. Right there. All right. Coming up at 1 p.m. is graphic content. Zach. The lovely Bronze and Scott with the Dwarf Beard get into real talk about the latest comics from Marvel, DC, and everything in between. Coming up at 3 p.m., watching paint dry with uh, my Viking lovely Lass. the Viking Lass. She paints and repairs mechs. We smash on Death from Above on Friday nights. And we will have this week's special guest, Lynx System. Look forward to meeting Lynx System if uh, Lynx System can get here before we leave. Uh, 6 p.m., because today is Wednesday, is Shadowrun Corporate Sins. Lauren does her best to kill our Shadowrunners as they uncover Seattle's deepest, darkest secrets. And the Jimbo will assign you a position aboard Thumper Sub Benefits. What the hell is that saying? So, you take this thing. <laughs> He was reading verbatim. It's a bad mistake. Uh, <laughs> when you need to read that part. Oh, don't okay. read that part. Wait, wait, don't read that part. Great. Fine. Forget that shit. You guys don't We're get to know done. what the subscriber benefits are for me because I don't have to tell you. But we will say this. Subscribe! It's worth it. It's fun. And uh, thank you for all, uh, all of your support in making Battletech. Uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again next month. And yeah. I will see you 6 p.m. Friday night for Death, Death from, from Above! above. Bye. Oh, QQ, take us the hell out. There.